Well, today we're thrilled to be joined by the CEO of TIPCO, Dan Streetman. Uh, TIPCO, of course, is a Palo Alto-based business integration software company, uh, helping uh, with information decisions, processes, and applications for more than 10,000 customers. I believe the headcount's around 4,000 and the market cap's a, a bit above a billion, uh, sorry, a four billion and about a billion in revenues. Uh, and so we're thrilled to have Dan Streetman here today. Hi, Dan. Hey, Jack, how you doing? Pretty good. Okay, as we dive in here, Dan, I got I got to say, a friend of mine sent me a video. It looked like it was uh, you skiing at the at the top of a mountain uh, in fifty mile an hour winds. I didn't know if this was training for your next Ironman or exactly how you got up there, uh, or if this was just you practicing proper social distancing. But I wanted proper to get the social back distancing story. absolutely. So uh, obviously, our friend Ken sent that uh, forward to you. Yes. Uh, so uh, we have a permanent residence um, in Lake Tahoe where my wife lives to be near our kids. And so we have done a, a decent job of getting out and getting some exercise. Yeah. Uh, we are being very careful. Like, of course, we want to be super careful in this area around uh, putting yourself at risk or putting first responders at risk. So we actually weren't very high. We we're on a small peak right behind our house right here in Olympic Valley. But uh, it's definitely good to get out and exercise in different ways. Um, it is... Uh, also trying to get on the bike and run as much as possible, but it's been a very busy time. I'd say that's uh, taken a bit of a backseat, but I'm also convinced that right, fitness really is a foundation to everything else we do in life or having a passion, whether it's fitness or something else is foundational. And so still try to get out and, uh, and take advantage of the outdoors as much as possible. Well, as we compared stories on um, uh, our activities and in, in Ironman events, I appreciated your description as, uh, you, I remember you referring to it as meditation with pain. And uh, I, I love that. I love that description. Hey, Dan, I wanted to just take a minute and, and say, uh, you know, as a, as a decorated veteran, I wanted to say thank you for serving our country. Really appreciate it. I know you also do a lot with uh, Wounded Warriors and the IAVA programs. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of how people can get involved in support of, of, of your efforts with those programs? Sure. And I, hey, I appreciate that. And on behalf of, uh, you know, our sisters and brothers who have done so much more, uh, thanks for commenting and thanking them. They are still out there manning and standing on the frontiers of freedom uh, around the world. And of course, as we embrace this, uh, you know, wartime environment as well, seeing them along with our first responders and anybody who's valiantly standing up to risk and serving us is someone we should recognize. My personal connection uh, is to uh, veterans. Uh, a brief uh, bit of my background, I went to the military academy and I stayed in what's called the individual ready reserves even after I left active duty. So as a result, uh, I deployed to Iraq uh, for most, well, for pretty much all of 2009. Uh, and uh, my re-engagement with, of course, my peers, and more importantly, the young women and men who were serving really inspired me to make sure that when I transitioned back, I provided a foundation for them. So I've been involved, I've been on the board of Wounded Warriors, uh, currently on the board of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans Association, uh, Vets in Tech, and I found an organization uh, at Salesforce called VetForce, which is now transitioned to Salesforce Military. And all of those are essentially designed to give transitioning veterans a chance to find their passion outside of service. It's a difficult transition to make. And for many of uh, those who serve, right, their first formative years of their professional lives, um, they deployed multiple times. And so mm -hmm. giving them something they can be passionate about, that they can share with others is what's key. And I think any of us can do that whether you're mentoring, creating a program, where you go that extra step to yeah. help a veteran make the transition. I think those are all foundational things that we do. I'm very proud of the work that IAVA does in both what we call rapid response to those who are having you know, challenges, either financial, personal, or mental, as well as the training programs that organizations like Vets and Tech do. Yeah. Uh, there's no secret sauce to exactly the way to be involved. The trick is take that extra effort to find you know, your group. And I also want to be clear, it's not, you know, veterans isn't the only thing to be passionate about. There are lots and lots of organizations and places. I do find though that, that finding that chance to give, you know, the, 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 the saying is true. You get so much back in return, the relationships that I've built, uh, the, the involvement in programs that help vets transition has really brought some great talent to the organizations I've led and has also been really personally gratifying. I've had a chance to learn a lot about the reboot program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. Uh, uh, a seed investment that we made into a company called Task Human uh, has, has led me to learn a bit more about that space. They're providing a video one-on-one -on -one, uh, video platform for health and wellness benefits. And of course, 
uh, you know, things like stress management and even sort of other, other elements of health and wellness to serve the veterans. They've got a, a significant partnership coming together between Task Human Reboot. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's given me an opportunity to learn a little bit more about some of the things that are going on in that space. And I like programs like Reboot. I mean, again, it, yeah. the, the, we have this unique point in time and not to get, you know, too deep into this aspect, but, you know, we've been in combat operations for the longest time our country's ever been in combat operations with essentially the smallest amount of women and men serving. Mm -hmm. So that population has had a disproportionate burden on them. Uh, and they're, you know, to some degree can be isolated. So anything we do to help them with that transition, whether it's giving them skills, uh, enhancing mentoring, mental health programs, benefits our country. Because in the end, these are leadership inclined, you know, young women and men who've gone through significant experiences and have a lot to bring. We just yeah. have to help, you know, gap, you know, bridge that gap. And what I found is the return to my organizations has been phenomenal. Fantastic. Well, thanks for that. Uh, let's let's switch gears and talk a little bit about your professional activities. Uh, obviously, now the CEO of Tipco. Uh, exciting times. Love to hear a little bit about kind of the journey that led you to uh, to Tipco because I you know I know you've got a lot of experience in the cloud and obviously tech and software uh, background. But but talk to us a little bit about sort of when you joined and, and sort of how things are going and maybe maybe priorities over the next year, how you're thinking about things now, particularly given the current environment. Sure, yeah, and so, you know, clearly I've followed TIBCO very closely uh, from when I first transitioned, uh, you know, out of the military, I went to business school, I came out here to Silicon Valley, and, you know, TIBCO's experience with essentially, you know, solving the most complex data challenges in the world has always been appealing to me, and we've partnered with TIBCO at various points in my career. Um, I've built my career in the customer-facing and partner-facing go-to-market side. Uh, to me, that's... Um, as equivalent as you can be to being an infantry infantryman and a paratrooper like I was, you're at the front lines, but also you're dealing with the mo most complex challenges, I think oftentimes helping customers solve problems. Mm -hmm. So it was a great transition for me to come to Tibco at a place where we're working with those, those challenges. And I also think our culture here is very much akin to what I learned in the military, which is look, individual achievement is great. Your personal contributions are critical, but they're always better when they're aligned to the whole. Mm -hmm. And to go, right, that's the way we think about solving data problems. Mm -hmm. First, you have to kind of connect to everything in your enterprise. And you want to seamlessly do that. Second, you have to intelligently unify your view of all that data. And third, that gives you that ability to then confidently predict. And that's where our sweet spot is. And a lot of things align to exactly that aspect of those things that I love most about service uh, and love most about my early stages in the career. Yes, I worked in CRM for a significant amount of time as well as in cloud companies and bringing all of that to bear here has been a lot of fun. Uh, I am really fortunate to join the team a year ago and uh, we've absolutely focused on accelerating all the good work we've done in research and development and then taking that to market. To pause for a second, we went private uh, right at the tail end of 2014 with Vista Private Equity and Vista has been a great uh, asset to us and a great sponsor, helped us increase and focus our R&D spending Mm -hmm. both organically and inorganically. And now we're really having a great opportunity to take that to market and uh, help our solutions. You know, we're in 21 of the top 25 companies in the world of the Fortune 2000. And that's a great and challenging place to be, particularly in a time like this. Yeah. I and mean, I know CEOs uh, across the country and around the world and investors, candidly, are looking for ways to help uh, with, you know, uh, solutions uh, and information um, in the you know, current environment with this pandemic of of COVID-19, you guys are actually doing something about it. I mean, you've got dashboards and tool sets. Can you just talk a little bit about the backstory that sort of led to, you know, how you utilize technology to help, um, you know, curb or slow down the, the current pandemic with, with information distribution about sure. what, you know, sort of what- Yeah, it, you know, in essence, it's, it's the, you know, the um, a terrific example of a data problem, right? How do we pull together disparate data to understand what's happening. So we have to connect, right, to that, those, those resources. Mm -hmm. How do we then make sure we unify so the data management aspects of that and even governing the important data and some data secure to then confidently predict. And we realized that we had those uh, capabilities available. So we built um, a COVID-19 tracking dashboard, but it's not just static data. It's visual analytics that enable uh, the user to dig in and determine things like, you know, we now are all familiar with the term R not right, which is the transmission rate of COVID-19, all things neutral. Uh, what you wanted to see is what's the effective transmission rate in areas where you've done non-pharmaceutical interventions. 
like in Washington state or like we did very quickly here in Northern California. Uh, so the ability to share that, those insights with policyholders and stakeholders and to make that public uh, was a very powerful thing for us. It obviously takes resources and our data science team has been working around the clock to answer requests. But uh, we took that step very early on in March to make sure we could shed some light on what really does happen when you social dis socially distance and what does happen when you limit mass transit. And that's all available at the tipco.com slash COVID-19 uh, dashboard. It's available for anybody to use and, and leverage. And it's really analogous to the things we're doing with our many of our partners. So mm -hmm. Ainge Healthcare, Norton Healthcare are all customers who are using TIBCO to help manage their resources. We have pharma companies who are using it as part of uh, their pharmaceutical evaluations. Uh, and all the way down to uh, communities understanding what the impact is and how they can assess at a localized county level um, their hospital beds, ventilators, effective PPE. Yep. Really interesting. Hey, one of the things that we do in, in the entrepreneurs organization is we're constantly sharing experiences on major industry trends so that we can kind of learn from each other. And, you know, after looking and learning more about your background at Salesforce and BMC prior to, prior to, to TIBCO, um, one of the things I was curious about is, you know, in the cloud space, are you seeing any major sort of evolutions or innovations that, that you think are interesting and that maybe might create opportunities for uh, new technologies uh, where, where maybe investors like me who are trying to elevate yeah. my uh, investing IQ should be paying attention? Well, so there's, you know, I'd say three fundamental things which are core to what we do at TIPCO and I think they're, they're across the whole spectrum. Uh, first, any solution you deliver now should be cloud native. So whether you're running it on premise like some of our customers still want to do or you want to be able to move it in the cloud to be able to move that infrastructure from compute to compute is important. And we see that as a strategy. In fact, multi-cloud was kind of a something companies had because they hadn't gotten their cloud strategy right. And now we see multi-cloud as a strategy where I will do certain in the high-end compute on one platform. I'll have my storage on another. I'll have another provider providing SaaS. So anything that helps connect a multi-cloud world or a hybrid world is critically important. And obviously that's a place we, we play closely. Second, uh, everything in addition to being cloud native for us is open. Uh, we do leverage the best of open source, whether that's Kafka and our flavor, we deploy to that. Making sure that we can interact with all other solutions out there is critical. So anything, again, that's open and helps you manage right, uh, those connections, whether that's API management or anything else, is critical. Third, a great area to address is obviously for us, everything we do has AI embedded. So in our analytics, there's not a separate AI aspect of it, our visual analytics are AI enabled. So if you, for example, want to see a different visualization, but you don't know exactly what it should look like, you can click on our AI tool helper and actually get a visual view of what it looks like. So those three key areas are great places where we're seeing all our customers continue to invest, where mm -hmm. we're leading the way in our thought process around how we architect our products. Mm -hmm. so everything should be cloud native. Everything should be open and leverage the best of open source. And you should think about having AI and machine learning embedded natively in everything you do. It's always interesting for me to hear about how corporates are thinking about accessing innovation. Oftentimes they're relying on their internal R&D efforts, but more and more these days, you know, there's been a tremendous rise in uh, corporate venture capital. Uh, 1,400 different corporate venture capital groups in 2019 made a seed or early stage investment. So I guess they've recognized that, you know, as opposed to just acquiring uh, maybe they ought to look at, you know, investing, maybe not even just at the late stage. Many of them are moving sort of upstream into seed and early stage uh, uh, areas to access innovation. Some corporate groups are, are clearly fine letting the risk sort of get mitigated out and, and sort of deploying really an M&A strategy to access new innovation. It seems as though that's where TIBCO has been focused, is identifying innovations that are logical acquisitions for the company. Can you just talk a little bit about you know, is that the strategy going forward? As, as you see, um, you know, the Fortune 500 in particular dramatically increase uh, their investments at early stage and increase their overall acquisitions in space like cloud, AI. You know, how are you thinking about accessing innovation at TIBCO? Sure, so there's, there's kind of two key ways to think about that and you, and you hit it exactly right. So where we've chosen to do our investing is the use of uh, our program, TIBCO Labs. So we provide our technology to both customers as well as partners. 
And all of that, right, even if you'd look at corporate venture, is really a way to just build deeper relationships and partnerships. So we've used uh, our people and our team and our TIBCO labs and our broad experience there to do that kind of investing and work with partners and others. And then, yes, we believe in both organic and inorganic uh, expansion of our market, anything that helps us manage complex data problems. So we have done uh, multiple acquisitions in, the, in of course, TIBCO's uh, you know, lifetime, uh, approximately 25 in our history, but eight of those have come in the last two and a half years. And so we're continuing mm -hmm. to invest, find places where there's great technology. Uh, most recent significant one was Orchestra, uh, which is a company out of France, a great um, master data management solution that really forms the foundation of our Unify portfolio and help bridge that idea between connecting everything and then confidently predicting. So we're going to continue to look at all aspects and we're investing again in our own development, making mm -hmm. all of our products cloud native, delivering everything, uh, you know, cloud uh, native when you need to and when our customers want that has been a big emphasis for us. And we're going to continue to be thoughtful about how we uh, bring in best of breed technologies to support that. And as you look at kind of the next wave of acquisitions, if you had any advice for, for young entrepreneurs or, or companies that, you know, are, are tracking well now, maybe becoming mid-stage uh, technology companies, maybe even acquisition targets, or if you're just trying to enlighten a friend of yours from the venture community who's trying to get smarter <laughs> on how to build companies that are interesting. You're, you're to asking for a friend? Yeah. <laughs> asking for a friend, yeah. Uh, but, you know, are, is there something that you're looking for, qualities, characteristic types of, a, of an entrepreneurial team, uh, particular sort of key metrics at, at a company? When you sort of think about, you know, sort of these acquisition targets, uh, my friend really wants to know sort of what uh, – uh, what, what, what sort of attracts you to, to those particular opportunities and, and leads you to ultimately acquiring those companies? Yeah, so, so first my advice would be to that point is focus on managing your destiny. So, right, if you run, do the foundation and the fundamentals right, you build technology that fits a market need and you focus on customer success, I think all those other things follow. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, if you don't do that, right, it's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, beyond that, then what do you do that's additional, the icing on the cake, so to speak? Obviously, I believe developing a culture that, that will sustain you through this. So again, I mentioned our orchestra team, which we acquired at the end of 2018. Phenomenally strong culture. They were able to integrate very closely to us and make sure we were aligned. We were aligned really well. Not every organization that you speak with is going to have the same culture. I have not experienced that here. I've always been part of a team that made sure we focused on that, and maybe that's the leadership and values orientation I have from my early upbringing. But to me, that's also critically important. It's just the compatible culture, the character, are they innovative? Do they think about that aspect of it? But all of that has to be fundamentally on a strong business. And if you build something, you know, simply for the design of what the end state looks like, I know you want to make sure there's a plan for that. But I think oftentimes, right, you miss those fundamentals. And I've seen lots of companies come and uh, you know, ha want to have that discussion that haven't really taken those steps to make sure they're a lasting organization and that that last transaction or strategic transaction is that's not a crutch. You yeah. want that to be part of something that comes together synergistically and really begins with, right, do I have the right product in the marketplace? Do I have the right strategy that makes my customers successful? Will they continue mm -hmm. to be successful? And then is my culture fit uh, what my plan is? And I think if you get those three fundamentals right, everything else follows. Mm, that's really helpful. Yeah, I've got a question for you on industry sectors. Uh, you know, what we saw is in the early days of the internet, there were many investors and entrepreneurs that viewed it as an isolated technology niche or sector. And now we recognize effectively that the internet applies to almost every aspect of business and every aspect of our personal lives. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. In a way, artificial intelligence has been pigeonholed into this one sort of core niche uh, even the industry sources out there are reporting on artificial intelligence deals done. At our firm, we have a slightly different view. We actually believe that artificial intelligence applies everywhere, that eventually right. um, the fact that, that we have a globally connected world, the fact that there's massive amounts of content being uploaded onto the internet, and there's this opportunity for pattern recognition, very similar to how the brain works, we, we, we believe that it applies everywhere. Can you talk about your view just generally on artificial intelligence and what the, what, what the potential is for that going forward? Yeah, so I made that, you know, as I talked about our foundational architectural design principles, as I mentioned, in addition to being cloud native right, and open, we believe AI is embedded in everything we do and that's the best way to approach it. Uh, you know, tools, capabilities, and the data science aspects of it 
are going to touch everything. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you build a specific, you know, industry function and focus, you can go very far from that aspect and you should. But I think, you know, if you're building AI just for, a, for an in-state, you know, you're going to have challenges in the competition. We believe, right, there's enough great innovation around it to make sure it's embedded and foundational to what you do. So to me, building a solution that solves a specific problem that's supported by AI is always a sounder strategy, particularly if you've got industry or domain expertise or a ways to approach that industry and solve that problem. You clearly see the ability to go to very targeted, you know, TAMs and be able to attack that head on. Yeah. We also believe that, right, some of the most complex problems in the world need to be, you know, solved with a very networked uh, open solution. And that's where we've tried to, you know, that's where we have worked to position our products and build our capabilities. Yeah, that's insightful. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I want, I want you to brag a little bit about uh, about your efforts at the, at the company, uh, Dan. I know uh, Gartner has its 2020 Magic Quadrant, right? And for what, four, fourth time, you guys have, have secured the master uh, data management solution in that Magic Quadrant. It gives you industry recognition. What do, what do you attribute, uh, in a sense, that, that recognition to? Is that is that something about the, you know, sort of the, yeah. the culture of the workplace? Is that just the dynamic CEO? Uh, is that, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you attribute, um, in a sense, the consistent uh, uh, yeah. industry rec- recognition to? So I think, look, look, fundamentally, you know, TIPCO has a 20-year strong heritage of leading innovation. And so we have, within our values, which are actually spell out the words TIPCO, we work together, we are innovative, we are bold, we're customer focused, and we're optimistic. And those values certainly ring true now and I'm not sure anything any, any time before. And so our ability to continue to maintain leadership positions is fundamentally a reflection of right, us accruing to those values, staying focused on what customers need. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you look at Gartner, or IDC, or Forrester, we're very proud of the leadership positions we continue to maintain. Mm-hmm. A lot of that's been supported uh, by the investment that Vista made into us. And so we're very uh, thankful for all the work we've been able to do with Vista Private Equity and continue to invest in both opportunities for growth as well as ways to support our customers. So whether it's, you know, the Gartner Magic Quadrant for Master Data Management or other areas, our goal is to continue to be a leader in each of those quadrants or waves uh, and make sure that right, we work together to drive those innovative outcomes. And we will always be bold. Uh, this was our kickoff shirt. So um, we will continue to live those values as well in everything we do. <laughs> Fantastic. I want to uh, switch gears and ask you a couple of, uh, of, of questions about sort of professional development and, and, and um, some elements of how you kind of manage life, if, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. And then, I'll, and then I, uh, I'll, I'll likely uh, uh, field a few questions from the CEOs that uh, are in the audience uh, today. Um, just, you know, we're constantly sharing ideas on professional excellence and, and things we do to sort of sharpen the saw and, uh, and, and bring our A game uh, effectively to uh, business and, and to management and to investing uh, every day. Is there something that you do as a, you know, as a high performing CEO of a major technology company uh, that, that you sort of do to make sure you're sort of mentally, physically, you know, sort of emotionally ready to take on uh, any challenges that may come each and, each and every day? So sure, again, uh, I, and I think there's two pieces of this. There's first what you, uh, how you lead yourself uh, and uh, what you do to make sure you're prepared to do that and then how you think about enabling your team to lead itself. Mm-hmm. So first, yeah, you do need to stay sharp. Um, I have a, you know, you would call it almost a stereotypical routine uh, for CEO of the global business. I get up about five. Uh, the first thing I do is I do spend about 45 minutes to an hour making sure I caught up with what happened in Asia, answer and find out what's going on in Europe. Heck, we're even three hours behind, right? The East Coast. So while some have the idea that you get up and do your workout right away, I do think it's valuable to engage and understand what's going on, either do an important call or answer an important message, um, either right on Slack email or otherwise. Then I try to always take at least an hour each morning. It's typically from six to seven to work out. Now, by default, I do that a lot of times in multitasking. So I'm either listening to a book if I'm running. Uh, I oftentimes, as my team knows, listen in on forecast reviews from a, uh, a spin bike. I'm a big fan of Wahoo, um, which is the electronic trainer. 
and that enables you to get into the day and you know starts you know pretty much in the meeting starting at eight o'clock. Uh, I am pretty religious about making sure I have that hour, and I save the longer training that I do for Ironmans for the weekends, which is also a good chance to kind of decompress. The one beauty about an Ironman training, like I said, is it takes a lot of time, but it doesn't take a lot of skill. So you really <laughs> can meditate, you know, you're just riding a bike, you're not even navigating close to other people. So with one ear, uh, you know, I'm able to listen to a podcast, I, I catch up on news or other things that's important to me and make sure I get that training in. And that usually Saturday morning time is my decompression. It's, it's my yoga, it's my meditation with pain. <laughs> uh, in the end, you know, you just, it's, it's suffering and math is all an Ironman is. If you can do math and figure out how many calories you take in, uh, then you'll be just fine. Now, how do you then take that and extend that to the team aspect of it? Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, General Stanley McChrystal. Uh, you might have seen uh, some of his stuff in the McChrystal group. Um, he published a book, Team of Teams, and his team is pretty prolific. Uh, I'm a big fan of making sure that your team has um, essentially shared consciousness is the term that General McChrystal uses, understanding everything, so making sure they're connected. And if they do that, then they understand the purpose. And he has, um, right, this great saying that purpose affirms trust, trust affirms purpose, right? And together they forge individuals into a working team. So making sure we set the systems in place to be able to communicate as an executive leadership team give the right empowered execution out to leaders has been critical. And in a time like this, it's really helped us. Uh, we, because we were using data science and run dashboards, we, for example, moved to work from home status ahead of most directives. And one of the key things we did is anyone who commuted via mass transit, um, we advised to work from home. Anyone who had a risk factor, we advised to work from home. Um, and to date, we've had no confirmed cases across our approximately 4,000 team members. And we've been able to keep all of our systems up for our customers. And I really credit that to the systems we built over the last year, ensuring that we're a team of teams and we have that shared consciousness. Uh, those are two, to me, the most critical pieces. You do have to look after yourself as a leader. The, the, net, the gut reaction at a time like this is for decisions to get centralized and everyone looks to the leadership team or the leader to make all the decisions. You have to be sharp and be able to do that when that matters but you also have to be very conscious of the times when it's best for your team to continue to execute. And uh, I'm very proud of the way our team has risen to the occasion to support our customers. And I think foundationally that team of teams thinking um, has, been, has been very important for us. Yeah, and this has been incredibly educational and inspiring. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise and your experiences with me and, and uh, my fellow CEOs and, and fellow investors today. I really appreciate your time. Hey, it's always great to uh, see you, Jack. I'm sorry it's not uh, in person, but I know that'll be soon enough. And uh, maybe if it's not then, we'll do it at uh, you know Ironman Northern California in Sacramento next year. I look uh, forward to it. <laughs>